Okay, welcome, welcome once again. Chemistry 3202 course overview our review. Here we go. Um, this is Unit 3, Section 1, Lesson 3. This is going to be um, some information on calorimetry. Um, it's going to be some simple calorimetry calculations. We're going to do more on calorimetry in the next section as well. All right, so calorimetry is dealt with in two uh, distinct areas. So this is just going to be an introduction to calorimetry with some simple um, calorimetry problems. All right, so let's have a look here now. Okay, constant pressure calorimetry. This is dealt with on page 661 of your textbook. And there's a few problems here, 664 to 665, related to uh, constant pressure calorimetry. Now, um, this little device we have here diagrammed is essentially a calorimeter that you guys would probably be using in your lab that you have to do on this, where you're simply going to be using a double, a double nested styrofoam cup. All right, and the styrofoam, of course, is acting as a nice insulation barrier to the outside world so that no energy can be lost uh, from the outside world or no energy can be gained. So any energy transfer, of course, is going on within this styrofoam cup. So we can think of the styrofoam cup inside here as being a universe. And this chunk of ice that's melting and absorbing energy from the water here, the chunk of ice would be our system. The water would be our surroundings. And remember now, we talked about this business of um, the only thing that it's really going to gain energy from is the, uh, the substance that it's in direct thermal contact with. So in this case, the stirring rod that we use to stir the solution really is not going to play that much of a role here because it's not in contact with the chunk of ice. And likewise, the thermometer that we, uh, we're using here is not in contact with the ice. However, we have to keep in mind that, yeah, it's there. So we've got to keep in mind that there's potentially some uh, loss or gain of energy with this piece of metal here, this metal stirring rod or plastic loop or whatever you use. Uh, and also, there might be an energy transfer to the thermometer. After all, what's causing the thermometer to go up and go down? It's that energy change of the alcohol within the thermometer, which means it's getting energy from the water. So keeping in mind that, yeah, OK, it will, it's got its limits, all right? But for the most part, we're only going to be interested in the energy exchange from the surroundings to the systems in this case, or vice versa. Uh, keeping in mind full well, too, that this is only a plastic cover. So there's going to be a little bit of energy loss to the outside world. But we're going to try and minimize it. And yeah, we're going to ignore it. All right, so here we go. OK, so we're going to look at uh, calorimetry. And we're going to do some simple calculations here. Um, calorimetry is defined as measurements of changes in, in heat. All right, so we've done the calculations in the last section here, Q equals MC delta T. Uh, what we want to look at here now is you know, how do we measure this? How can we practically go and measure the heat changes here? And the device we like to use is something called a calorimeter. That's what we just described to you on the other page. And it's based on the, the first law of thermodynamics and the idea that we just explained that any energy lost or gain is going on within the calorimeter. And there's no loss or gain of energy from the outside world. All right, so we're looking at that. So in this uh, in this example, uh, Q system is equal to minus Q of the surroundings, and we're not interested in any other forms of energy. We're not interested in in, in sound or light or anything like that. We're only interested in the amount of heat energy that gets exchanged, and and no loss of the energy to the outside world. Right, so Q system equals minus Q surroundings. Um, we say there's two, di two different types of calorimetry. And we're going to try and focus mostly on the uh, constant pressure calorimeter. And what we mean by constant pressure, just for your information, is that the, it's open to the environment. So if we had to do a little experiment, let's just go back to our, our picture here. If we had to do a little experiment here, and there was a chemical reaction going on, and gases were bubbling off, like you know, if we did sodium bicarbonate and hydrochloric acid, um, carbon dioxide gas would be bubbling off. And because there's holes in this cover and the gases are capable of escaping through, um, the pressure inside this, even though gases are being produced, the gas is allowed to escape. And the pressure inside this calorimeter would be the exact same as it is outside. It would be atmospheric pressure. Now you might be thinking, well, that would be a loss of matter. So wouldn't that be somewhat of an open system where we'd have a loss of heat energy and we'd have a loss of matter? Absolutely, we'd have to take that into account if we wanted to be accurate. But in any case, a constant pressure calorimeter is one that does not allow gases to build up. The gases can escape, and it will be the same pressure inside as out. Um, so that's what we refer to as a constant pressure calorimeter. In this case, 
it's only the water that's considered to be the surrounding. So it's a real simplified form of, of calorimetry. It makes our calculations real simple and easy. And we're going to assume then that the, the system um, and the surroundings, the water is the surroundings, and the system is going to gain or lose its energy to the water, and only the water. There's another type of calorimetry that we're going to talk about as well, and this guy is called bomb calorimetry, or constant volume. And in this case, it's a little more complicated than simply using a styrofoam cup with water. In this case, the calorimeter is a really complicated object that has many different things in it that can absorb energy and have to be taken into account. Let me show you a couple of diagrams here. In this case, we're going to be using constant pressure calorimeter. So anything that has an aqueous solution, so things like the dissolving of sodium hydroxide or the dissolving of ammonium nitrate, like in a cold pack, if we want to figure out how much energy is going to be exchanged, they're great because it's aqueous solutions. And obviously, the surroundings is going to be water. So observing a process that occurs in water would be ideal. We wouldn't do the, say, the combustion of gasoline or the combustion of ethanol in the styrofoam cup because once we combusted the gasoline, the styrofoam cup would be no more because it would catch on fire or blow up. That would be no good. Not only that, many of these solvents like gasoline would actually dissolve the styrofoam cup, so it wouldn't be any good. So generally speaking, the only time you would use these guys for the most part is when it's OK to have water as the surroundings when the reaction or process is OK to undergo in water. All right, so aqueous solutions. Um, here's a bomb calorimeter. And you can see that this is a lot more complicated. We've got a mechanical stirrer here. We've got this big steel bomb, which can be made of platinum or palladium or, or steel or anything like that, something that's going to be inert that's not going to interfere with the reaction. And it's a rigid vessel. And once this guy is sealed up, if there's any pressure that builds up inside, it's supposed to be strong enough to withstand that pressure. And that's why it's called a bomb because we don't want it to blow up. So we could put something in this container, and we'd have to ignite it to get it to, to burn. So let's say we wanted to figure out the energy in, say, cornflakes. We could ground up the cornflakes, put in this little bowl, ignite it using the ignition wires, and then as the cornflakes burn in oxygen, we could actually measure the amount of heat energy that gets transferred to the water, and then we would measure the water. So you can see that. Uh, in terms of thermal contact, there's a lot going on here. All of this combustion that's going on in here is in contact with this great big container, which is in contact with the water. And you've got to figure out how much energy was used to ignite it. So it gets to be a real complicated um, process here. So rather than just say the water is the surroundings, what we say is we give the specific heat capacity uh, of the calorimeter uh, a value of C, which takes into account this object, this object, this object, this object, that bowl, that loop of wire, all of these things are included in the value of the calorimeter constant. And that's not going to change from today, tomorrow, to next year, because these are the same objects every time you use it. So what they do is they generally calculate the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter and stick it on the label so that the next person who uses it knows exactly how much energy this entire object is going to absorb. So it's a little more complicated. And the reason, of course, it's called constant volume is that if something is in here that's going to produce gases, the pressure is going to build up inside now. And if you start getting into more complicated calorimetry problems, if you go into university and whatnot and start doing some work on the chemistry there, you'll find out that when gases expand, energy is lost. All right? So by preventing the gases from expanding and escaping, we minimize the amount of energy due to the expansion of gases because right, the gases are not allowed to expand. Uh, so it's a little more complicated. For us, we're going to try and keep it to this nice, simple thing, because this is cheap. It's styrofoam cups. It works well, because everything we're going to be doing is going to be an aqueous solution. And it's really efficient. We get real good results with this, because of the insulating effect of the styrofoam. Works nicely. There we go. Okay. Some of the things we want to consider here when we look at the styrofoam cup is that it's a simple insulated container. And we know exactly how much water we put in here. So what we would do is we would weigh this apparatus empty. And then we would put in the amount of water, say 25 milliliters or 20 milliliters. And then we'd weigh it again. And that would give us an accurate mass of the amount of water as our surroundings. All right, so easy enough. Um, and we were saying that anything that involves an aqueous solution, so any form of heating or cooling, like the melting of ice or the warming of, of water, anything that involves phase changes here, melting of ice, 
Um, solution formation, that would be the dissolving of, say, sodium hydroxide or ammonium nitrate. How much energy would be associated with that as it dissolves in the water? Any chemical reactions that occur in aqueous medium. So that would be something like um, a neutralization reaction of an acid in a base. Hydrochloric acid, AQ, mix it with sodium hydroxide, AQ, and figure out how much energy is involved in that neutralization reaction. So as long as it's an aqueous solution and water is involved there, we can do it. All right. We're going to make an assumption here, and we know it's a bold assumption because we know full well that there's more going on here than just the exchange of water with the ice or whatever. We know that there's going to be a loss of energy here. The styrofoam cup is going to absorb some energy. But we're going to ignore all that and say, now let's forget that. Let's keep it simple and say that there's no loss of energy to the outside world. The only thing we're going to be interested in is the water and whatever the system is. Okay, so complete and total transfer of energy, no loss. So what we're saying then, um, the calorimeter water then is taking on the entire role of the surroundings. So if the, if the calorimeter water is the surroundings, then we've simplified our calculation by simply say, let's use the specific heat of the water only. Forget the stirring rod, forget the thermometer, forget the styrofoam cup. We're going to say they're insignificant. Over here with the bomb calorimeter, we said, no, no, this is very significant. We can't ignore this big steel bomb. We can't ignore the ignition wires. They're going to absorb a lot of energy. Over here, we're going to say, ah, let's forget about it. Okay, let's ignore it and say that it's negligible. Um, so, and we're also going to assume then that even if we're dealing with an aqueous solution, suppose we're dissolving some salt, NaCl, into a solution. We know that when we throw salt on ice, it causes the ice to melt on our steps and whatnot. If we want to figure out how much energy is being produced as we throw that ice or as we get the ice to dissolve, uh, we can actually do it here and do the calculation. So even though the sodium chloride becomes part of the water, we're still going to assume, even before and after the reaction, that yeah, we, even though we know it's salt water, we're going to assume we still have pure water. Okay, That's another assumption we're going to make here. And you might be saying, well, we're going to get some errors in our calculations. Yeah, but what we're going to say is that the amount of difference that makes is pretty much insignificant. So it's not going to make a whole, a whole roll of beans, I guess, to the final calculation. It's going to be very insignificant. So let's ignore it altogether, just to make it simple. Another thing we want to look at is we're going to say um, the final temperature of the system and the surroundings is going to be the same. We're going to let a chemical reaction or a physical process occur and let it go until we're satisfied that there's no longer any temperature change. If something heats up or cools down, we're going to let it go until the temperature change stays constant. And in that sense, what we're saying then is we're going to let it go until um, we have the same final temperatures. And what we have is what's called, remember we talked about this before, if the temperature is the same, we're going to say that they've reached thermal equilibrium. Well, let's try it again. They've reached thermal equilibrium. Okay, and we've seen this before when we had these two bricks, and we said if brick A and brick B are at two different temperatures, they're going to continue exchanging energy until their average kinetic energy is the same. They're going to have the exact same temperature. So the same thing is true here. If I drop a piece of metal, a very piece of hot metal, in this um, container of water, we're going to see that the hot metal is going to give up its energy. Actually, the metal is going to sink to the bottom, isn't it? Because that's <laughs> It's not a piece of ice. Okay, so this metal is going to sink to the bottom, and um, this energy is going to be given off to the water, and the water is going to warm up. And we're going to measure that change. So when the water stops changing its temperature, we know that it's going to be at the exact same temperature now of the piece of metal. The metal cools down, the water warms up, and they reach the same temperature, so we say they're at thermal equilibrium. So in this case, Tf of the system is always going to be equal to Tf of the surroundings. And we've got to keep that in mind now when we do a few calculations. OK, here we go. Here's a simple calculation that we're going to look at. Well, that's simple. They're all the same for the most part. If you can do one, you should be able to do them all. It says a very cold piece of silver that has a mass of 78.41 grams is added to a simple calorimeter that has 150 grams of water. The temperature of the water changes from 19 down to 16. We want to calculate, and we were given the specific heat capacity of the silver. The very first thing we want to do here is we want to calculate the heat change of the silver. 
So what we want to do is we want to isolate and define what our system and what our surroundings is. Now, because we're dealing with some simple calorimetry here, the surroundings is always the water. The system is going to be the object we're studying. In this case, it's going to be the piece of silver. So I want to write down what I'm given and what I need to find. So in the case of the silver, I'm given its mass, and I'm given its specific heat capacity. And that's about it. That's all I know about the silver. Well, what do I know about the surroundings? Well, I know the mass of the surroundings. It's 150 grams. And I know the specific heat, even though they didn't tell me. I know that I'm dealing with pure water, so that's a given. All right, you can get that from your, your data tables. And I'm also given the initial and final temperatures of the water. Okay? Now, we know that the water went from an initial temperature of 19 down to a, a temperature of 16. So this guy was cooling. So the delta T here, the change in temperature for the water, was negative. It's a loss of energy. So what we're saying here is the H2O lost energy because it's negative. All right. Now, we want to do some calculations here. We want to look at this and say, OK, we know that there's an energy exchange here. So if I can calculate the energy of the water, we know that all of that energy came from or went into the system because of the first law of thermodynamics. So the very first thing I'm looking at is I'm saying, can I calculate the energy of the water? And the answer to that should be yeah, absolutely. We know the mass. We know the specific heat of the water. And we know the change in temperature. So right off the bat, I can calculate the amount of energy change of the water. So it's 150 times 4.184 times 16 minus 19.3. And this should be a negative value because it cooled down. It went from 19 down to 16. Tf minus Ti. It started warm. It cooled off. So this guy had a temper at, a, at an energy change of negative 2272. It lost that much energy. That makes sense because it cooled. All right. What we're saying now is that, well, why did it cool? Well, because it gave up its energy to the system. In other words, the first law of thermodynamics is saying the energy lost by the water must have been gained by the system. So in this case, we're saying that we know what the system is. It's the silver. So the amount of energy of the silver is equal to minus Q of the water which turns out to be the exact same amount. It's just that it's a different sign. Because the energy lost by the surroundings was gained by the system. All right. Now, the question is, can we figure out the, uh, so that's the, that's the heat change for the silver. That's done. Perfect. We got it. The next question says, well, how cold was the silver to start with? So in other words, what we're trying to find out is we want to find out what Ti is for the silver. And in order to do that, if we could figure out what Tf was, we'd be well on our way. Because we know that Q of the silver is mc delta T for the silver. I know the mass. I know the specific heat capacity. I just don't know the temperature change. But if I could get Tf, then this temperature change would be easy to get. So the question would be, well, yeah, we know what Tf is, because we know that the system and the surroundings is going to be in thermal equilibrium. When this is all said and done, the piece of silver and the water it's sitting in should be at the exact same final temperature. So that's good enough. Bingo. The final temperature of the silver is 16.11. What I'm going to do now is solve for one unknown. We're going to solve for Ti. So as we start looking at this, we put our values in, the Q that we just calculated, the mass, the specific heat of the silver, and the, initial, the, the final temperature is 16.11 minus Ti, Tf minus Ti. I don't know Ti. Let's solve for it. So this is just a simple little bit of mathematics here. So we go down through. I'm simplifying it. 78.41 times 0.24, I get 18.82. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this side by the 18.2. And there we go. And then I'm going to solve that. And lo and behold, it's a positive 120.7 equals 16.11.
I'm simply going to bring my 16 over to the other side. There you go. And lo and behold, we see that 120.7 minus 16.1 equals a minus TI. Now watch what just happened here now. This is a minus TI, so 104.6 minus TI. I'm going to bring my minus sign to the other side, so TI is equal to minus 104.6. Does that make sense? Well, the actual size of the temperature really is hard to predict, but we're saying that it should have been really cold because the water lost a lot of energy. And the water lost its energy so that it could warm up the silver. So yeah, being a minus 100 degrees Celsius, could be. That, that sounds right, especially since it uh, finished at 16, so it warmed up significantly. It went from a minus 104 to a plus 16. So it gained a significant amount of energy. There we go. So again, to, to revamp what just happened here, we can calculate the Q of our surroundings. We can do the first law of thermodynamics. And then we can use that value for Q to solve something about our system. And that's generally what's going on with calorimetry. We're finding the energy in indirect measure. OK, here's another problem. This guy's saying it's a bomb calorimeter this time. And this time, the heat capacity is given. Now, you notice that there's no mass in the heat capacity. So in the last lesson, remember, we said when there's no mass given in the heat capacity, then our calculation is going to be Q equals C delta T and not Q equals MC delta T, because this value does not depend on mass. So this guy is going to undergo a decrease of energy, which means it's going to be a loss. So that's going to be a negative um, energy, because it's going to be a drop of 1.56 degrees Celsius. So when this very cold piece of iron is added to it, we want to calculate the heat change of the iron. So the iron is what we're studying. We have no idea what it is. We want to figure out Q of the iron. And what do we know about our calorimeter? Well, we know it's heat capacity. It's 105 kilojoules degrees Celsius. It does not depend on mass, so we don't need to know its mass. We know its change in temperature. It was a decrease of 1.56 degrees Celsius. So I got enough to do this calculation. Because we can calculate the amount of heat energy that the calorimeter um, released. It released 1.64 kilojoules. So C cal delta T, easy enough. Where did that energy go? Well, first law of thermodynamics is telling us that the energy is being exchanged from the system to the surrounding. So we're saying the energy lost by the calorimeter is going to be gained by the iron. We plug this in here, and we can simply say here now that Q of the iron is minus Q of the calorimeter. So minus of a minus 1.64 is a plus 1.64. There we go. So energy lost by the calorimeter was gained by the iron. Do we have to do any further calculations here? Well, that's all they ask us to calculate. Nice multiple choice on a public exam, right? OK, here's another one. Simple calorimeter this time contains 150 grams of water. 5.2 gram piece of alloy at 525 is dropped into the calorimeter. Probably going to melt the bottom of the styrofoam cup. But hey, um, we'll probably use something a little more rigid than a styrofoam cup. OK, it's dropped in the calorimeter, causing the temperature of the calorimeter water to increase from 19, so that's the initial temperature, to a final temperature of 22. We want to know the specific heat capacity of the alloy. All right, so the object we're studying is the alloy. We know what mass we have. We have no idea what the specific heat capacity is. We've got to calculate that. And we know the initial temperature, but I don't know the final temperature. OK. Um, in this particular example, the surroundings is going to be the water, because it's a simple calorimeter. So we know the mass of the water. Therefore, because we're dealing with pure water, we know the specific heat capacity. We also know the initial and final temperature of the water they were given. So once again, we want to be able to figure out the, um, the Q of the alloy. So in order, sorry, the C of the alloy. So in order to do that, we're going to have to do something like this, where C is going to be Q over M delta T. Now I, I know the mass, and I, know, I think I might know the temperature. Well, the final temperature should be good enough, because it's going to be thermal equilibrium again. So therefore, the final temperature should be the same as it is for, this, for the water, 22.68. So um, right off the bat, I know delta T. 
I know my mass, but I don't know Q. Hmm. I should be able to find Q. Ah, yes, I can. Look, mass MC delta T for water. I can calculate the Q of the water. Here we go. So Q of the water equals MC delta T of the water, 150 times 4.184 TF minus TI. Be very careful there, TF minus TI. This works out to be a plus 2121 joules. OK, so that was the energy absorbed by the water. Where did that energy come from? First law of thermodynamic knows any energy absorbed by the water had to come from the system, or vice versa. So what we're saying then is that the Q of the alloy is minus Q of the water. So in this case, the alloy lost the 2121, whereas the water gained it. So we're looking at the loss of energy by the alloy. Okay. Now that we know Q, we're in business, because we know mass and we know delta T as well. So we're looking at this and we're saying, OK, Q of the alloy, no problem. We just rearrange our equation. C of the alloy equals Q alloy divided by MZ delta, MT, delta T. Sorry. OK, getting ahead of myself. There we go. And we'll just plug our values in. Now what we've got to be careful with here is the fact that when we calculated specific heat capacities in the last lesson, we said everything will have a positive specific heat capacity. So we've got to watch this negative sign here. We just can't throw it away. Because this negative sign is saying that the, the Q, the alloy, lost energy. So what I've got to watch here is this, this temperature. It's Tf minus Ti. So it's going to be 22 minus 525. This is going to be a negative value here. And the negatives are going to cross out. So we are, we're, we'll take care of that. The negative signs are going to be taken care of. So here we go. And it works out to be negative 2121 divided by a negative 2612. And this works out to be a positive 8.12 um, joules, joules, because that's the energy per gram degree Celsius. So joules on top, grams Celsius on the bottom. And that is our unit for specific heat capacity. So very important to be carrying your units here and showing all your work, showing me the formulas. On the public exam, they're going to be correcting you for process, stating the first law of thermodynamics, showing me this calculation, carrying your units, and demonstrating that the grams are crossing out, the Celsius cross out, and we're left with joules. And then again down here, the fact that You've carried your units, joules over grams, degrees Celsius, and that's how we arrive at that. So not, not so much as showing it on the public exam, but when you do this yourself, if you carry your units, you know what units to expect. And yeah, that's what we expect for a specific heat capacity. There we go. So that's a practical use of, bond, of, of calorimetry. Here's another one. Uh, it says the temperature of a simple calorimeter this time. Notice there's no mass here, so it's just kilojoules degrees Celsius. The calorimeter changes from 25 to 23. Uh, a very cold piece of copper was put into it. We want to calculate the initial temperature of the copper. So this is very similar to the one we just did there. And we're looking at this and we're saying, well, we know the mass of the copper. We know the specific heat capacity of copper. We don't know Ti. We don't know Tf. But we do know that we've dropped this in a, in a bomb calorimeter, or a, a heat capacity calorimeter here, with 1.05 kilojoules degrees Celsius. We know the initial temperature of this guy, and we know the final temperature. So because we know the final temperature of this one, we now know the final temperature of our copper. It's going to be thermal equilibrium. There we go. And now we're saying, can we calculate this? Well, absolutely. Um, we want to be able to get the initial temperature of the copper. In order to do that, we have to do this calculation here. Uh, Q equals MC delta T for the copper. We know, we know M, we know C. We don't know Q, but we can find it. Therefore, we can calculate TI. OK, so we can figure out the Q of the calorimeter. So once again, because there's no mass in this unit, we don't have to say Q equals MC delta T. It's just QC delta T. And this works out to be a negative 113. So the calorimeter lost energy. The calorimeter cooled off. Did it? Yeah, it started at 25. It cooled off to 23. So this is telling me it lost energy. That energy was lost to the piece of copper, says the first law. All right. And therefore, Q of the copper is going to be 
uh, negative Q of the calorimeter, so it's going to be a plus 1.113. Now, what we got to watch out for here is the specific heat capacity of copper is given in joules per gram degree Celsius, whereas the heat capacity of the calorimeter was given in kilojoules degree Celsius. And this is another reason why you should be carrying your units when you do these calculations. So this value works out to be 1.13 kilojoules, which means it's 1.13 kilojoules for the copper as well. But I need to convert that to joules, because this value here is going to be joules. So I'm going to multiply that. A kilo means 1,000, right? That kilo right there means 1,000 joules. So I'm going to multiply by 1,000 to get 1,113 joules of energy. All right, we would continue on then and say Q equals MC delta T for the copper. We'll punch our values in, and we notice, lo and behold, we've got the Q of the copper. We've got the mass. We've got the C that's given in your tables. We've got the final temperature from thermal equilibrium. We need to find TI. So you simply solve through to solve for that one unknown. Okay. The big thing that people do wrong here, of course, is they get scared or don't know what to do with that negative. So we simply solve, multiply here, 4.92. Now I'm going to divide 1113 by this, and that should give me my value. There we go. So we solve that, and of course what we get is, coming down to the other side here now, 225.9 equals 23.94 minus TI. So remember what we did here. We bring over the 23.94. That's going to be equal to minus TI. And then, of course, we get 201.91. And this is where people go wrong. They forget about this minus sign. You have to bring that over. This is going to be a negative 201. And think about your answer. Um, this, it says a very, very cold piece of copper. Well, if, if the 200 degrees Celsius is not cold, that's very, very hot. So keep in mind of what you're doing here. And if it's going to be very cold, then that negative sign comes over to make it minus 201. Oh, wow, that is cold, right? So it's a very, very cold piece of copper. And it causes the calorimeter to cool off, right? It causes the calorimeter to give up its energy. The piece of copper actually warms up because it was very, very, very cold. And there we go. OK, now what you should be noticing in all these calculations, they're basically all the same. We're finding the Q. Somehow we get enough information about either the system or the surrounding to find one of the Qs. Then we do the first law. And then we would find out what it is we're looking for by using another Q equals MC delta T to find one of these unknowns. So every one of these problems is, per, you know, for the most part, identical. Same procedure, same way of going about it. OK, one last problem. I know it's taking a bit of time. You can fast forward it or stop it or whatever. But anyway, here's another example. It says a new ceramic material underwent for use as an insulator. All right, So Newfoundland Light and Power is looking for some kind of new material to put on the tops of their poles as insulators. And they're playing around with some new ceramics. It says part of the analysis, in order to figure out what this compound is and how it's going to behave, is to try and find a specific heat capacity. Uh, and we know that if something is going to be an insulator, it doesn't want to absorb a lot of energy. So it's going to have a very, very, very low uh, specific heat capacity. And if it does, then it's going to be suitable as, a, as an insulator on the top of a, of a light and power pole. So here we go. We're going to take a 20 gram sample of this ceramic material, and we're going to heat it to 200. So we'll pop it in an oven, put the oven on 200, let it sit for a while until thermal equilibrium is reached. And then we're going to take that piece of ceramic material, and we're going to drop it in a calorimeter and we've got a very, very precise calorimeter, OK? Newfoundland Light and Power is not going to use styrofoam cups. They've got a very precise calorimeter here, 1.46 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So it's going to be a very accurate measurement here. And they know that the temperature change of this calorimeter went from 24.87 to 27.15. Very accurate measurements, four digits of precision here. We want to calculate the specific heat capacity of the ceramic, OK? So we're studying ceramics. That's our system. We know its mass. We know the initial temperature. We don't know C. That's what we're trying to find. What do we know about our surroundings? We know that the calorimeter is very accurate. It's 1.46 kilojoules degrees Celsius. Notice there's no mass. Okay. 
We know the initial and finer temp final temperature of this, so therefore we know the final temperature of our piece of ceramic. It's the same thing, thermal equilibrium. So the question would come up, well, how do we calculate the value of C? Well, once again, we know that C is going to be Q over M, C, M delta T for the ceramics. We know M. We now know the change in temperature. We just don't know Q. But can we find Q? Absolutely, because we, make, we can find Q of the calorimeter. All right, so Q of the calorimeter, C cal delta T. We put our values in TF minus TI. Again, be very careful of that. And we're saying the calorimeter absorbed that much energy. So the calorimeter went up by 3.329 kilojoules. It absorbed a lot of energy. And that should make sense because the piece of ceramics was heated to 200. We're putting it in the calorimeter, and we're going to let it cool off. The calorimeter is warming up. It gained energy. OK, good. Where did that energy come from? Well, it must have came from the first law, saying, hey, you, got, you gain energy. You've got to come from somewhere. came from the ceramics. OK, so in this case, once again, Q of the ceramic material is equal to minus Q of the calorimeter. And again, this value is giving it to me in kilojoules degrees Celsius. Anytime we do a specific heat capacity, it's going to be joules per gram degrees Celsius. So I have to convert this to kilos to joules. So kilo means 1,000. So it's going to be 3.329 times 1,000. And we get a negative 3.329 joules. So that's how much energy was released by the ceramic. And therefore, now we can calculate the um, C of the ceramic material. We're simply dividing both sides by um, M delta T. So C equals Q over M delta T. And we'll plug our values in. And lo and behold, now again, watch out for that negative sign there, eh? because the specific heat capacities are always positive. So when we do TF minus TI, so 27 minus 200, definitely a negative energy change there. The two negatives are going to take care of each other. And lo and behold, we get a positive 0.963 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, um, That guy absorbs a lot of heat energy. Okay, now what does that mean? It absorbed a lot of heat energy. Well, it means the heat is not being transferred. It's insulating. Just like aluminum insulates more than, say, copper. Copper has a very low heat capacity. It transfers its energy really easy. Copper is a very good conductor of heat. That's why we have copper kettles. Aluminum with a heat capacity of 0.9, not very good for pots and pans because it doesn't really conduct heat that well. It insulates. Uh, so in this case, yeah, somewhere around the heat capacity of aluminum. I'm not sure if that's what they're looking for, but they'll know. If this is what they're looking for, they're going to say, well, this material will do because its specific heat capacity is in the range we're looking for, or that heat capacity is nowhere near what we want. That, that ceramic material, that type of ceramic is no good for our purposes. So you can see that it has a practical use here, right? especially when it's done to very good accuracy. Okay. Uh, here's a couple problems you can try, and this time I've included the answers here, so you can do your calculations to see if you can get the answers that I have listed there. Um, if you can't, then make sure you check with your online tutor here, or drop me a line in the discussion posting, and we can see what you're doing and, and uh, see how things are working out. In any case, make sure you use your online tutors and all the online materials there to help you. Go to a public exam and go get a couple problems that are calorimetry and see if you can do them. All right? I bet you can. They're all the same. Okay, see ya. See you next time. Bye-bye.